Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to talk about the distinction between, on the one hand, laws of nature and, on the other hand, universal generalizations. And this is a distinction that is made in the philosophy of science and is useful in understanding people's thinking about laws of nature. So what I'll do is I'll start by telling us a bit more about laws and then a bit more about these universal generalizations. And then I'll introduce you to the philosophical puzzles that these terms give rise to. So laws of nature. I'm not going to try to give a definition of that because like the whole project of this philosophy of laws of nature is to try to explain what laws of nature actually are. But what we do have are some clear examples. So for instance, take something like Newton's law of gravitation, right? which tells us that any two bodies in the universe attract each other with a force that is proportional with the mass of the first and proportional with the mass of the second and inversely proportional with the distance between them. So that is Newton's law of gravitation. And that is supposed to be a clear example, a, an exemplary example, we could say, of a law of nature. Some things we might be tempted to say are the laws of nature tell us how the universe behaves, for instance, and the laws of nature are what science is after. Now, those are already maybe controversial statements, but they give us a little bit of a the taste of what we want to explain when we want to explain what laws of nature are. And other laws of nature might be maybe the laws of general relativity or the laws of quantum mechanics or the laws of thermodynamics. So that's laws of nature. Now, a universal generalization is, uh, one could say, a much more philosophical term, right? Laws of nature come from the sciences, but universal generalization comes from philosophy. And a universal generalization is really just a statement a true statement, usually when we talk about it in, in this context, a true statement that starts with for all, right? Or all blah, 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 and then something that you're going to say about those blah, blah, blahs. So if I say something like all objects attract each other in such and such a way, I'm making a universal generalization. If I say uh, all people are rational, I'm making a universal generalization and so on. Now, sometimes we use phrases like all or everything or everyone in a much more limited or restricted way. If I say um, um, all people were wearing hats, like I'm probably just talking about people at the party, right? That's not supposed to be a kind of universal generalization, but I can turn it into a universal generalization by saying all people at the party were wearing hats because now it's sort of true for everything. If something is a person at the party, then it was wearing a hat. And that is true for absolutely everything in the entire universe. So universal generalizations are simply statements like that. They range over everything in the universe. They say something about that. And in the context that we are in right now, they're usually supposed to be true, right? If I call something a universal generalization, I'm going to mean that it's true. And if I call something a law of nature, I'm going to claim that it holds, right? That it's also true or dare or whatever we have to say about that. Okay, now we come to the philosophical puzzle, which is what is the relation between on the one hand laws of nature and on the other hand, universal generalizations. And in order to understand where it, this puzzle comes from philosophically, it helps to think back to the philosophy of science in let's say the 1960s and 1970s. So here we have philosophers who are trying to understand science and they're trying to do that in a way that contains as little metaphysics as possible, right? They really don't want to introduce any sort of heavy duty metaphysical concepts or entities or items that are not sort of already posited by the sciences themselves. And so laws of nature, which on the one hand is a term that they kind of need these philosophers, they need it to explain what scientists are looking for. They need it to explain how scientists explain things and so on. So they kind of need to talk about laws of nature, but it also seems a little bit suspect. I mean, what is a law of nature? I mean, you, it already conjures up images of some lawgiver 
who writes down the law and now everything has to listen to it. Well, how does that work? Right? It seems a bit mysterious. And so philosophers try to give a kind of deflationary account of it. They try to tell a story about laws of nature that doesn't involve any heavy duty metaphysics. And so maybe what we can do is we can simply identify laws of nature with true claims that have a particular special logical shape. And so maybe we can just say that laws of nature are these true universal generalizations, right? Maybe that's what we can say. Maybe it's just that whenever we say something that is true of everything in the universe, then we have a law of nature. And we might be encouraged in this view by looking at something like Newton's law of gravity, because that is supposed to hold for everything in the universe, right? For every two things in the universe, they attract each other with, well, this force that the formula gives us. So maybe laws of nature and universal generalizations are basically just the same. Well, that turns out to be a position that is hard to defend. It's a position that's hard to defend on the one hand, you could say like, like the first problem, but it's not the biggest problem. But the first problem is that um, it seems that we would have to call a lot of things laws of nature that we don't usually call laws of nature, right? So it's maybe Newton's law of gravity is a true universal generalization, but it's also a true universal generalization that all living human beings have organs like hearts and kidneys and stuff like that. Well, that doesn't really sound like what scientists would call a law of nature, right? I mean, this is not like what, if you look at a biology book, they're not gonna write this down and say, oh, we found this law of nature. But I mean, they're not talking that way. So that's a little bit awkward, but maybe as a philosopher, I can say, yeah, that's right. I mean, scientists talk about laws of nature only in very special cases, but actually maybe all these true universal generalizations, we could call all of them laws of nature. And then scientists are just picking out the most interesting ones. And that's what they talk about. Maybe you can give an answer like that. But there are bigger problems. So probably the most interesting problem is that universal generalizations tend to miss certain properties that laws of nature are supposed to have. And that in fact give laws of nature their special status within science, within explanation and so on. And the most interesting of those properties is that laws of nature are supposed to be what I'll call modally robust. Well, what do I mean with that? What is modally robust? So the modal in philosophy always has to do with possibility and necessity. And laws of nature are supposed to be modally robust in the sense that they tell us not just what is actually happening, but they also tell us what could happen. They sort of set the bounds of the possible. So even if we go to other possible situations, other things that could have happened, they will still fall under the laws of nature. So for instance, if the law of nature, let's say the laws of nature tell me that um, um, these two things attract each other with a certain force, and they are at a distance of one meter and they have certain masses and I calculate it, all of it, and I get a particular force. I mean, if that's what really happens and the law of nature is true, then of course it, it holds, right? That's the force with which they attract each other. But suppose, right, this is not actually the case, suppose that one of these objects had been twice as heavy. Right, let's take the earth and the moon. Suppose that the earth had been twice as heavy, right? What would have happened with the earth and the moon then? Well, Newton's law of gravity is still going to give us the right answer. So it's not just giving us the right answer in the actual situation. It's also giving us the right answer in all kinds of speculative and merely possible situations. And that's why we can use laws of nature to think about what would have happened in situations that didn't actually take place. And they also allow us to think through what is going to happen in future situations where maybe we don't know which of those situations is going to happen or where maybe even our choices are going to determine which of those situations is going to happen. So laws of nature hold across all of that, right? Whatever we choose, 
or whatever the situation might have been in the past, the laws of nature would still have been true. And that is absolutely not the case in general for universal generalizations, right? So here's a universal generalization for everything in the universe. It is true that if it is a bust on my desk, then it is a bust of Nietzsche, right? For everything in the universe, absolutely everything, no exceptions. If it's a bust on my desk, then it's a bust of Nietzsche. Here it is. That's a true universal generalization, but it is not modally robust. It could have been different. If I had come across a nice bust of Kant, I might well have bought it and put it on my desk, right? And then the generalization would have been false. What's more, I can easily make it false. I can go online right now and buy a bust of Kant if somebody is selling busts of Kant. And if they're not selling busts of Kant, they are thieves of their own wallet because here is the audience for bust of Kant. All right, um, so I can make this generalization false in the future if I want to, right? There are things I can do in order to make this generalization false. It's not modally robust. Now you might say, yeah, okay, Victor, but that's because you are talking about your desk. I mean, technically it was a universal generalization, like for everything in the universe, if it's a bust on my desk, then it's a bust of Nietzsche. But it's kind of fake universal, right? It's only about my desk, but that doesn't actually solve the problem. Right? I can formulate like real, like globally true statements that are really about the entire universe, which are still not modally robust. So here's an example. Suppose that I claim that in the universe, there is no golden sphere of 10 billion kilograms. That's probably true. Like I'm not certain of it, but it's probably true. Actually, as a good Kantian idealist, I might not want to say that, but I'm gonna bracket my Kantian idealism and I'm just gonna say, it's probably true. There's no one billion kilogram golden sphere anywhere in the universe. Well, it's still not modally robust, right? There could have been, and I guess we could make one if we sort of really wanted to, if all of humanity wanted nothing more than to make a 1 billion kilogram sphere of gold, then I suppose we could make it our mission and we wouldn't be destined to fail, right? It's possible to do that. So here we have a universal statement, again, totally universal. It's about the entire universe um, and it's not modally robust. And philosophers of science have liked to contrast this statement about golden spheres with a different statement. I mean, if somebody tells you that in the universe there are no one billion kilogram spheres of enriched uranium, that's also probably true. In fact, it's certainly true, but that is modally robust, right? There couldn't be any one billion kilogram spheres of enriched uranium because that's gonna explode like a gigantic atomic bomb, right? And rich uranium, you put a bit of it together, it explodes. One billion kilograms is way past the critical mass of enriched uranium. So this couldn't possibly exist. Like it's the laws of nature that forbid it. And so it turns out that if we want to explain what the laws of nature are, we need to do something more. Right? We can't stop at the logical form of the statement like it could be a universal generalization. Yeah, but that's just not enough. And maybe it's not a universal generalization. Maybe laws of nature are something different. And then we have to wonder, well, does that mean that we have to bring in heavy duty metaphysics or not? And so there's a class of philosophers, like for instance, David Lewis, who have said, no, we don't need heavy duty metaphysics, right? Maybe a law of nature is a universal generalization with a special status in science. Who knows? And that would be, again, a fairly deflationary approach, trying to get as much metaphysics out of science as possible. <clears throat> it might not be clear that it gives us what we want, right? How, how are we really going to get this modal robustness from that kind of status? 
And so other philosophers have said, no, I mean, laws of nature are really something else. They really are maybe in some sense the rules of the universe or they describe the essences of objects or something like that. And you've got to bring in some kind of metaphysical story of precisely the kind that the philosophers of science in the 60s and 70s didn't want. And that has brought us to all kinds of stories about laws of nature, stories about modality, stories about essences, and so on and so forth. But those would be fodder for other videos. Thank you for listening.